Um, <laughs> so, you know, just a moment more of painful anticipation. <laughs> so, um, hey, these things spin. So, when you put a magnet in your finger and it's a myoneutral sheath, it's in a myoneutral sheath specifically so it can move around, so it doesn't get adhered to by scar tissue, which means if you take your finger and you take a magnet and you do this, you can feel it spin in your finger. <laughs> which is, to this day, one of the weirdest things I have ever felt. <laughs> um, now, being that this is a bunch of body modders who came up with this idea, they were immediately trying to figure out how they would put it under the clitoris. Is, um, um, <laughs> jokes raged around. Given what happened with the magnets, fortunately, as far as I know, no one has put them in their, into their genitals. Um, so there's an oops. There's a big oops. So when you beta test things, you know how things can go wrong? <laughs> Sometimes you're beta testing on your own body, <laughs> and things can go wrong. Um, so I get contacted fairly often still by people who go, oh my god, that's the coolest thing ever. How do I get one? I will do anything. Please, please tell me how to get one. Um, uh, I am going to tell you why I don't ever tell anyone how to get one anymore. Um, uh, so I traveled in late 2005 out to, now we get to some of the bloody parts, um, um, to Phoenix and had my finger sliced open and had this little round magnet put in. Now I couldn't get, I didn't get as much sensation as a lot of people because I have these tiny hands and they would only put a tiny magnet in my hands. Um, so it's just kind of relative to the size of the magnet. So everything went really, really well for the first couple months. It healed up nicely. Um, and it was great, and um, as a matter of fact, I have, I have a favorite anecdote from this period, which is that it was only truly like, useful in my job once, which is that I was at a um, major company that makes internet infrastructure devices that will go unnamed. And um, I was at their, their journalist Dog and Pony, and they were showing off this, um, this kind of IP over whatever the hell we want, barbed wire, tin cans thing offering that they were putting through. <laughs> and, um, you know, it ends in a phone line and it goes in there showing this is this basically this broadband over whatever we want because we are amazing. And I reached down and touched the phone cord and I just went, wow, that is a lot more than you can actually put through a phone cord in the wild. <laughs> and I'm with a whole bunch of, I was a whole press gaggle and I'm like, so this demo isn't real. And they're like, how do you know that? And I'm like, it would take way too long to explain. <laughs> just, just trust me, this demo is bullshit. <laughs> um, but, um, um, so, <clears throat> this, is, uh, this is actually after everything went wrong. This is an example of my party trick, the one thing I have, uh, the one thing I have left over. I didn't actually bring any rare earth magnets. If anyone has one, I'll hold one up for you, if you like. <laughs> but it generally looks like this. This is a series of rare earth magnets that I'm dangling off my ring finger. So, originally, it didn't look like anything. You couldn't see anything under there. This little black spot is after the bioneutral sheath that was in breached. It broke open. Um, I had an infection. I took a week's worth of Cipro. And then my body started to attack the magnet. Um, now, it's, the magnet is a neodymium, bor boron, and iron. And um, my body basically crenellated it. It took all the iron out of it. Um, and then the scar tissue just came and kind of came around it and pulled on it. So at this point, I'd gone through an infection. It was painful. Um, I lost the sense, completely lost the sense. Um, and I could barely even lift up magnets. And I went to my GP and said, let's get this thing out of me. I have a very tolerant GP. I'm like, so this week I've... <laughs> and he's just like, can you hold on while I get a student? <laughs> um, but um, but he he... he Tried, he's like, all right, I'll try and pull it out. <laughs> um, and so here we are uh, trying to pull it out. And believe it or not, this is one of the less graphic photos I took. I actually did take these photos on <laughs> his other hand. <laughs> I'm a very tolerant doctor. <laughs> so um, as we were trying to pull it out, you see, he went in and he sliced it open. He took some um, basically big old medical tweezers and tried to pull it out. But it had crenellated which is something we didn't completely understand at the time, so it shattered in my finger. 
and it spread all over in my finger. And eventually, after about an hour of trying to dig this thing out, I said, you know, I am done. Uh, I'll just finish up the story. I am really done with this. And he went, I kind of am too. And we sewed up my finger, and I went and did some toxicology research and decided small amounts of, of neodymium and boron were probably not that big of a deal. <laughs> so at this point, I have, a dark thing. I have a dark spot on my finger. I have no sense. I have a, a case, something that if I tap on it real hard, actually hurts, which wasn't true before. And, um, and I can't even pick up magnets, because the whole thing's shattered. And that's pretty much the end of my sad tale of woe, except it's a magnet, right? So over the next four months, it pulls back together in the tip of my finger. <laughs> and I can pick up magnets again. <laughs> So, bodies and magnets, both creepy <laughs> in their own way. Um, never got the sense back. Um, well, I can sense magnets. <laughs> One of the things, like when people are being very critical of me, they're like, well, what happens if you were near an MRI? And I'm like, well, the whole thing is that you couldn't really sneak up on me with an MRI. I kind of know it was there. <laughs> so, but I am deathly afraid of MRIs, because if, um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with this magnetic uh, imaging technology, if there was an MRI at the other end of the room, it would pull the magnet out of my finger. Um, uh, worse, nobody knows at this point, um, Shannon Lorette, who had quite a few more of these than I did, um, wanted to go get an MRI for uh, knee surgery or something, uh, I don't know. And, um, and they decided that they wouldn't give him one because even if they removed it, they just don't know what the effects of having these magnetic particles floating around potentially in your system are. So does the neodymium and boron still pull out of you? Because <laughs> frankly, you know how I'm saying, this would pull the magnet out of me if there was an MRI over here. Just to get some perspective, this would pull the magnet out of me if there was an MRI over there just through my body. <laughs> so MRIs and I, not so much. <laughs> And, um, and, yeah, I knew that there would be no MRIs while this was in. I thought we might be able to remove it if I ever needed one. Now that's not so sure. I may be no MRIs for the rest of my life. Um, uh, I still am planning to get this removed, and I probably will try transcranial magnetic stimulation, and I will hopefully live. <laughs> so, um, other things people are doing right now. A lot of people have heard about people implanting RF, um, RFIDs. So the thing that I don't care about implanting RFIDs is that there's no functional difference between implanting one in you and carrying one with you. Um, and this is why I kind of roll on swiftly from that. And it's not that, you know, I'm kind of, I'm all for people cutting open their bodies and sticking in whatever they want. I just don't think it's that interesting because you could just wear it. <laughs> um, that doesn't give you much. However, and this is kind of like, I'm skipping kind of ahead at this point, talking about some of the other stuff. There is another, the Verichip's about to do an implantable RFID that is also a glucometer for diabetics. Um, I am actually currently discussing, currently talking to their PR department, trying to talk them into letting me have one. Um, although I am not diabetic, um, the way this works is it's a glucometer in an RFID, and it takes continuous readings. I believe they're done optically, and it's all powered inductively, and you need a reader six inches from it or less. That reader can pretty much be anything. Um, so if you've got anything that can kind of go through their process or can take from their reader, then you can pretty much take that da data and do whatever you want with it. So what I'm hoping to talk them into next year is um, continuous glucometer readings that I can feed up to a web page. Um, so you'll be able to follow my diet, I suppose. <laughs> and it's, it, the, you know, one of the things is that we, I'd really like to be able to cross-reference that with other data, so I'm gonna have to like note my mood probably to get good data on, you know, how insulin is affecting me in some way or another. Um, uh, and just put, you know, continually put that all up, up online. Um, so, uh, I don't, you know, I've got the question of what can that get you, and I'm not entirely sure yet, but I think it's kind of interesting that we don't have a lot of data on uh, continuous glucometer readings for people who are either diabetic or not, because it, it requires a stick at this point, and uh, it might be interesting to have the data sets find out what that's like. We have a lot of theories, we don't have a lot of actual having done it. Um, so the other things I'm looking at are an, uh, an ovometer and a hydrometer. One tells me my estrogen levels, the other tells me my water levels. Um, all of these are increasingly things that you can either stick on you or in you. 
Um, so yeah, I, I just added this, you know, obviously right before the talk, Sputnik, but for blood. <laughs> um, and, you know, the, the idea of these kind of little, we're, we're inventing a lot of these little sensors right now, which are fairly cheap. I mean, the, the, the Verichip um, Digital Angel glucometer is not an expensive RFID. It's more expensive than the regular one, but it's not super expensive. It's just a, a continuous reader encased in glass. In order to get in that size, you almost have to get it that cheap. The reader might be more expensive, but we're increasingly having a number of these kind of uh, medical monitoring gadgets that you can put in your body. And there's just going to be more and more and more of them. And as they become more available, you will have the option of putting them in yourself, whether you are ill or not. They're just, you know, frankly, Verichip likes to sell things. And <laughs> they're going to want to sell you this. Um, so um, this actually, I, I'm kind of, you know, and that's, that's me talking about next year's projects. And we, I'm kind of jumping around a little bit at this point. Um, getting a little bit more philosophical for a second um, uh, before I jump into the medical stuff. Um, I'm talking about functional body modification as enhancement rather than treatment, um, which is kind of how we normally research these things. Like, in order to be allowed to modify humans, we have to have this idea that we're bringing them back up to the, the, the level everyone else is at. Um, and then anything after that would be unethical. Um, and, uh, and there's a lot of medical ethics guiding this, and it's fairly universal. Um, but it's really, really arbitrary. So there was a great uh, uh, editorial uh, a little while back that, that I just kind of note up here real quick about um, uh, enhancement of sports, uh, sports professionals. Um, because there's a huge push in America against sports professionals using steroids. But they all get LASIK. And they get LASIK to get better than 2020 vision. That's not cheating, but steroids are. So, um, and it kind of reminds me, like, uh, just, to, just to kind of go off on a, another tangent. Um, uh, I, did a, I did a piece on, um, on uh, subdermal implants, the horns and things like that, that you saw in the previous picture at one point. And I um, was interviewing a lot of plastic surgeons about it. Actually, I started with the body modification artists, and they told me um, the, the American Medical Association will tell you that modifying the body as far as plastic surgery goes, away from societal norms, or modifying it towards societal norms is ethical, and what they do, but modifying it away from societal norms is unethical, and you can lose your license for it. Um, so I thought, this is the perspective of the body modification artists. I must go and get a balanced perspective from the plastic surgeons. And they were like, no, that's right. <laughs> and I was like, don't you see? No, okay, never mind. <laughs> they're, they're just like, and quite a few of them kind of would hold forth, and I talked to quite a few of them for this, would hold forth about how it was right to give people bigger boobs and better hips and lips in order to give them advantages in life, but if you modified them away from societal's ideas of beautiful, you were in no way serving the Hippocratic Oath and you needed to be disbarred from medicine. I guess it's disbarred from law, but anyway, same difference. Um, so, um, uh, we have this kind of weird tension about what counts as enhancement and what counts as assistance or treatment. Um, uh, I did that. So the, the next thing I pointed out, and I, I used to not cover pharma at all in this talk, but it's kind of ridiculous to not cover pharmaceuticals um, because that is clearly one of those things that's just becoming overwhelmingly prevalent in our lives. This talk brought to you by Provigil and Ambien, that same wonderful doctor <laughs> who, who tried to pry the magnet out of my finger, um, uh, gave me essentially, you know, um, the 21st century uh, legal equivalent of an upper downer cycle to do this trip on. So one of the reasons I am not very jet-lagged at this point, and frankly, one of the reasons I am awake at all is because I am on ProVigil. Uh, Modafinil, I'm trying to remember its other name. No, you don't know. <laughs> um, and, um, and ProVigil is this amazing drug, which I think is bringing up a lot of ethical quandaries. I mean, uh, is anyone familiar with it? Okay, so ProVigil is, um, is a drug that was originally developed for narcoleptic, nar narcolepsy. Um, it just keeps you awake, but it's not completely a normal stimulant. So the deal with ProVigil is it would keep you awake, but when you wanted to go to sleep, you just could. And it didn't have any abuse potential. People weren't, wouldn't get addicted to it. It's not amphetamines. Um, here's the weird thing they discovered, is that if you take ProVigil after you haven't slept, you don't pay for not sleeping. 
Next time you want to go to sleep, you go to sleep for eight hours, you get up, it's like nothing ever happened. Then they started going, I wonder what happens when we give this to soldiers. 